Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on the book of Proverbs. We are studying this book of Proverbs for the first three months of 2015, the months of January, February, and March. And this particular lesson is lesson number 10 for March 7 of 2015, entitled, Behind the Mask. Hmm. I seem to remember that in Greek, behind the mask or under the mask is translated a hypocrite. Are we talking about hypocrites here? Who's behind the mask? Well, we'll have to find out. Let's, uh, I hope you have your Bible handy because you're going to want to check us out here to see if we're really telling the truth. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we're thankful for the truths revealed through this book of Proverbs. There are so many things to talk about we can never begin to cover all of them. But now as we talk about the truth, what might be an absolute truth, what might be present truth, help us to sort out which is what we need to know and sort out what is not true. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This particular lesson will focus on the challenges of speaking the truth and discerning the truth from what we hear. In the Garden of Eden, the beautiful flying serpent spoke words that seemed so exciting but we're full of deadly poison. Satan is a master of deception. He can appear and does appear as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11.4. But as dangerous as he is, our own self-deception may be even more dangerous because we're so inclined to believe it. Do any of us, none of us here would be self-deceived, right? What is an example of self-deception? Well, when we... a, a very public example of self-deception are all the people who believe that Sunday is the right day to worship. Mm -hmm. The Pope issued an encyclical, I, I think it was called something else, but anyway, a huge document that was, I don't know, 70 pages or more about the Sabbath. And it goes all the way through all the reasons from the Bible why you should keep the Sabbath. And you could have read it and said, man, that's great. And then all of a sudden in the middle it says, and we all know that Sabbath is Sunday and so forth. And went on talking about why we should worship on Sunday. Well, the cate catechism says uh, Sunday is the day that follows the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Some catechisms well, say Well, the, the most recent yeah. one, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, you have to say that in Spanish, don't you? I suppose. So yeah. So the way we delude or deceive ourselves is to accept something for truth that has no proof, that yeah. we, or not has no proof, but can, actually can be proven the other way. Martin Luther said he believed that seventh day was, was Saturday was the Sabbath, but he didn't see any reason why it was necessary to, to bother himself with that fact. Right. We do those things all, every day, though. I mean, we hear that wine is good for you, so have a drink, or that dark chocolate is, you know, for me, that would be more enticing <laughs> than wine. But, you know, there's a well, limit to, yeah. to what What are the most good. common ways that we deceive ourselves, maybe even unwittingly? How often do we try to deceive by using flattering words, appealing speech, even wonderful sentiments? You know, anybody who believes that they're right are potentially deceiving themselves. Was Jesus telling us the truth when he said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves? Absolutely. Well, what does that have anything to do with my comment? Well, if we've got a lot of people who are self-deluded out there. No, I'm, you didn't listen to me. People yeah. who think they have yeah. the truth well, those already have potential to be self-deceived. But a lot of those people do have the truth. I know, but um, you need to entertain the possibility you could be wrong. And research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most people 
that I've talked to about religion believe that they have the truth. And they're such divergent ideas that Correct. they can't be mutually true. That's well, <laughs> but most of them still believe that they have the truth. Yes. A very obvious case is Roman Catholics believe that Mary is in heaven, pleading with us, and, and God accepts their prayers because she pleads on their behalf. And Protestants basically say she's not. Can't be, both be right. Because there's nothing in the Bible that supports that. Yeah. That's the reason. Well, there are things in the Bible that support the opposite, actually. That's, that's right. That's right. Well, this section of Proverbs starts with the end of 24 and goes into 25. And the first verse of chapter 25, our lesson, doesn't discuss it. But let me ask you about it. Here are more of Solomon's Proverbs copied by men at the court of King Hezekiah of Judah. Does that mean that this book wasn't complete until King Hezekiah's time? And what would that imply? And that was 200 years later. So that's when they actually... 300 years later. 300? Yeah, almost. Uh, almost. So that's when they actually wrote down. It was word of mouth until then, but then they wrote it down. Well, that's one possibility. Are there any other possibilities? It may have been written, but not together with the rest of the book. Not in a fancy book. And I would remind you what I said back when we were studying Lesson 1. 1 Kings 4.32 says Solomon composed 3,000 proverbs and more than 1,000 songs. We know of two songs and about 500 proverbs. Where are the rest of them? It says this was Hezekiah's efforts to bring revival to Judah, yeah. and he elevated the forgotten wisdom of David and Solomon. So he was trying to bring a revival to his people? Yeah, he was, yeah. Well, one of the things we learn from a good education is how much we don't know. I tell a story about myself. When I went to a very small, very rural country school in northern Idaho, I think there were about 100 books in our library. I had read all of them several times by the time I graduated from the eighth grade, and I was pretty sure that I knew most of what you needed to know in the world. <laughs> so. <laughs> And of course, the further along I went with my education, well, I realized, I mean, really, an education is learning how much you don't know. The more education you have, probably the more you understand that you don't know. And fortunately, fortunately we, 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 we get better at learning where we can get that information if we need it. You had 100 books when you were in elementary school. How many books do you have in your computer? Uh, this computer has about uh, 5,000. 5,000 books, OK. Yeah. It's a lifetime experience, isn't it? You, you, the door opens and you see the light finally a little bit of it. Well, we, we live in a world that's incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I mean, I, I can't begin to understand even all the details of everything I should know in my field of medicine. Not even close, okay? So how can we come to understand God? Isn't he way beyond us? Well, how far do you think you need to understand him to, to feel good about it? Well, I mean, isn't, you know, there's verses in the Bible that seem to suggest that religion is to know God. To know God. Yeah. But how much do you have to know him to say you know him? Well, of course, that's a fair question, uh, certainly more than just his name. Jesus sat down with the uneducated peasants and farmers and uh, beggars and explained God in very simple terms. Uh, so no, you don't need to be educated to know God. What do we do with a verse like Proverbs 25, 2 and verse 3? We honor God for what he conceals. We honor kings for what they explain. You never know what a king is thinking. His thoughts are beyond us, like the heights of the sky or the depths of the ocean. Is that Solomon trying to hide his wisdom or what? Why would we honor God for what he conceals? Hmm. Well, that's a way of saying he knows so much that we don't understand or even know about. Mm -hmm. Now, the word conceals, yeah, where good. did you get that word? That's what well, it says uh, right yeah. here. Yeah. That's what it says. But I would, I would put in response to some of these Proverbs, uh, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us, 
But behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. That's Jeremiah 8, 8. So some of these things are not all that great. The, this little footnote says that God keeps things to himself because he needs no counsel. On the contrary, kings rightly seek to know what they must know in order to rule. Well, I, let me read you another verse. Isaiah 45, verse 15. The God of Israel who saves his people is a God who conceals himself. What does that mean? Well, if he were to represent himself, we'd be overwhelmed. In fact, we, we can't, none of I don't know anybody that could live in his presence. But uh, we would be intimidated. We'd be uh, feel duress and, and uh, coercion and so on and so forth. And God just keeps himself out of sight. And unfortunately, then it's probably out of mind for us or some People of us. People who have had God revealed to them or portions of God, what is their reaction? Wow. Yeah. I mean, do they fall on their face? Seems Most like a lot of yeah. people seem to fall on their yeah. face. Mm -hmm. The ones that we know of were Moses out on top of the mountain, and he came down and was glowing. Mm -hmm. He had to wear a veil because he was so glowing. Yeah. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration to the well, inner disciples. He appeared to Ezekiel. He appeared to Jeremiah. Samuel. Yeah. Well, Abraham. think about these words. Talking about God revealing himself. This is Deuteronomy 17, starting with verse 14. After you have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is going to give you and have settled there, then you will decide you need a king like all the nations around you. By the way, this is a good place to interject the thought that many scholars think that the predictions in Deuteronomy are so precise that they could not possibly have been written before the events. They had to be written afterwards because it couldn't have been so precise, so accurate exactly what's going to happen in the future. So precise in Deuteronomy, it had to be written after the events. And so it's not, it's not really a prediction, it's just a piece of history. Are these people who believe that God cannot tell the future? Yes. No, I, I think they all actually don't believe that God really even said that, that it came from a man. Well, and that's another possibility. I mean, that's what they... they I'm reading on. Now, what he says, suppose you, you choose yourself a king. Listen to this. Make sure that the man you choose to be a king is the one whom the Lord has chosen. He must be of your own people, one of your own people. Do not make a foreigner of your king. Do not make a foreigner your king. The king is not to have a large number of horses for his army, and he is not to send people to Egypt to buy horses, because the Lord has said that his people are never to return there. The king is not to have many wives, I wonder if that reminds, anybody we're about, you know, reminds us of anybody we're studying about now. Because this would make him turn away from the Lord, and he is not to make himself rich with silver and gold. Solomon says that in his day, silver was so common it was lying on the streets. When he, became, be, when he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life every day, so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations. Can you imagine? Try to imagine how different the history of Judah and Israel would be if they had actually done that. What about the politicians we vote in for the United States? Wow. Well, that thing, it, that promise fell apart after, after Solomon. That was, <laughs> that, that, the, the, the guy that collected these proverbs, it uh, mm -hmm. fell apart after that. With Rehoboam and Jeroboam. It, Apparently just, with think, Solomon. just think if they didn't have many wives, but only a few. Yes. Just two or three, huh? Yeah, just two or three. <laughs> <laughs> well, David seemed to be, do a lot better with a few than Solomon did with a thousand, <laughs> for whatever reason. It is better to live in a corner of the roof yeah. than in a house shared with a contentious woman. There you go. <laughs> okay, now, this, this, this <laughs> proverb... <laughs> not all women are contentious, though. That's, yeah. Well, when you point. start having too many women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> a how few many, will be okay. Okay. How many of the things that happen to us every day are completely out of our control? Most of them. Mm -hmm. How should we feel about such things? Is it is that a good good reason to keep on praying? Yes. Many people in our day seem to have dismissed the idea of anything of the, any absolute truth. Do we believe that there are absolute truths? I personally believe that God knows them, but nobody else really does. They're all kind so of so the Ten Commandments there. are negotiable. Well, you got to remember, you got to read the Ten Commandments, and you have to interpret them, and they're always being interpreted finer and finer as mm -hmm. time goes by. Okay. So the question is, does any of that constitute an absolute truth? Well, I, that's what I said. Um, God can conceive absolute truth, but mm -hmm. we are heading towards it all the time. Well, and our rel go ahead. I live near a community, liberal, who seem to have thrown out the idea that there's absolute truth as a community. It's a very friendly place to be. I mean, it's like it, there is a, a standard, you don't mistreat people, but it's, it's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't believe, that, okay, that's okay for you, but for me, and that's your truth, but this is my truth. Yeah. And uh, it drives me nuts because I think there's truth, but I can't um, complain about the interactions. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, really, I don't really fault that, what you just said. What I'd rather have them say is to have them keep talking together to try to try to merge minds a little bit, not just say, okay, you, that's the way you're looking at it. I want to look at it this way, and then they don't try to go any further. Are there certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong? Yes. yes. Definitely. And where do they come from? They come from God who defined them, but who a lot of people don't recognize that it comes from God. They say this is how our human laws are. Do you know okay. what I mean? Yeah. What would you say are absolute truths? Okay. God exists. God is love. Mm -hmm. Never changes. God never changes, although the Bible says that he changes his what mind. What does existence mean? And what does love mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, we're, we're kind of finding those out as we go along, and I think we'll be learning that all through eternity. Is it absolute truth that you're born male or female, or do you get the opportunity to choose what you want to be? I mean, this, this is... Those are questions people ask today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're really well, bizarre questions. what about this? Uh, the, Proverbs 26, 11 and 12. A fool doing some stupid thing a second time is like a dog going back to its vomit. Guilty. The most stupid <laughs> fool... <laughs> The most stupid fool is better off than someone who thinks he is wise when he's not. Boy, that ought to not hit a few. Teachable, are they? Hit a few people, right? <laughs> well, look at some other things. Judges twenty-one twenty-five is a very interesting verse. There was no king in Israel at that time. All the people did just as they pleased. Or the King James says, "Everyone did what was right in his own eyes." That's what's happening today. Mm -hmm. Now, was that because they didn't have a king? Well, that's the question. The one who's writing this book seems to think that that's because they didn't have a king. So they needed a king. That's what that's this person what is saying. It but God like didn't it. want them to have a king, correct? No, he didn't. Another way to look at it might be that they did what was right in their own eyes because they didn't consider God to be their leader, and they ignored him. Mm -hmm. And the king would help them to ignore him. God. <laughs> That's what ended up happening. And it may be saying that the king, as in God, they had no king, they had no God, they had no, they did everything according to their own way. But it so, said that the king was supposed to keep the Bible close by and read it every day. If, if, yeah, if, if there was, if there mind. was a king, he was supposed to keep the Bible close by. That author said that? Yes. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy yeah. said it. Uh, how often do we 
do what we think is right and get into trouble? Several times a day. There is something we can boast about. What is it? Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. The Lord says, The wise should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me. Because my love is constant, I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me. I, the Lord, have spoken. What do we do with that? Can the Adventists boast of knowing God? As far as they know him, I think they could. We've already talked about the fact that God is way beyond us and it's probably not possible for us, uh, certainly is not possible for us to know him fully. I th I'm really looking forward to the idea that when we get to heaven, we will, we will be able to continue learn, learn forever, continually learn more and more about God. So if you tell me, do you know all about God right now? I say, man, I hope not. What would I learn in heaven? The one infinite God is not insecure. He doesn't want to, sh he isn't one that does not want to share with his creatures. He wants yeah. to educate them. How much of modern culture is really foolishness? Have you ever listened to a politician or a used car salesman or some such person who was so convincing in the way they spoke that you almost wanted to believe something you knew wasn't true? Mm -hmm. Are there certain absolute truths that we can use to form a basis for core values? Here's a truth. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. We should be on the alert to, to say words spoken in right circumstances to people who need to hear them. And then it says, like apples of gold in settings of silver. Mm. Okay. Do we ever have times when we have to balance our values and, and, and ignore certain values in, in, in favor of other values? Can you think of an example? Our values and the world's values, or do you mean our values and our values? Well, I can tell you one of the obvious questions we, we struggle with in the field of medicine, and I had a patient like this, I remember very distinctly, a young woman, and I was working in Africa, came in and she had a serious heart condition and she got pregnant. And when you get pregnant, your heart it requires an extra 30% or so of cardiac output, and her heart wasn't up to it. And of course, we didn't believe in doing ab abortions, and she, she didn't want an abortion, although I, I considered telling her that, you know, maybe this is something you ought to think about. And what was the result? She died. And the if, baby died too. And of course the baby died too. If we had aborted the baby, she would probably a good chance she could still be alive. So there was your value of no abortion versus the life of the mother. Well, it was her choice. Finally, it was her choice. We told her what the options were, and she said, no, this is what I want. And she gave her life for what she believed. Mm -hmm. Now that's a, I mean, that's a, you know, do you, do, we don't believe in killing babies. But is it better to kill a baby than to kill a baby and the mother? Those are, those are tough a ethical questions that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. I um, think you used the word kill, but maybe let them die would yeah, be a well, better word. Yeah. Hmm. <coughs> There's not too much difference between those two. Oh, <laughs> well, it's the active ethical. versus the passive. Yes, ethical, yes. So then we will uh, have to um, provide an answer to God why we made the choices we made? Well, some students seem to spend more time figuring out ways to cheat than they spend studying for the examination. What's going on there? How much time do lazy people spend finding excuses for their laziness? I heard one person say, fat people have the longest arms of anybody. What do you suppose that means? <laughs> Know where the food's at. <laughs> you know, I don't want to move. I, I can, I can probably reach that. 
might not be able to move. <laughs> Probably maybe not be able to. <coughs> Proverbs 26, 13 and following. Why don't lazy people ever get out of the house? Why are they, what are they afraid of? Lions? Lazy people turn over in bed. They get no further than a door swinging on its hinges. Some people are too lazy to put food in their own mouths. Who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Solomon compiled it, or <laughs> Hezekiah, compiled, Hezekiah it. compiled it from Solomon's right, Solomon's lazy, compilations. Yeah, a lazy person will think he is more intelligent than seven people who can give good reasons for their opinions. And I've run across a lot of people like that. Any of the rest of you had that experience? Well, you've heard the English expression, nothing ventured, nothing gained. What does a lazy person say to that? Don't want to gain too much, anything. Too much trouble to, to venture, right? I might lose. How many people are lazy because they don't want to put in the time and effort to evaluate new ideas and try new things? How open are we to new ideas? Do we study new ideas carefully as did the noble Bereans? You remember Acts 17.11. And I would remind you of these words from Ellen White. In the judgment, men will not be condemned because they conscientiously believed a lie, but because they did not believe the truth, because they neglected the opportunity of learning what is truth. Patriarchs and Prophets 55, paragraph 2. So what's our responsibility in sharing the truth with others? If people out there conscientiously believe that what their church is teaching is correct, should we leave them alone? Boy, I, I stumped everybody, huh? Well, they're sincere. Isn't well, I, I gave a pastor who believes in the rapture a... Um, copy of the conflict series and a Revelation and Daniel commentary, and he said, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, you try, but where it goes from there, yeah. you... Well, I can tell you this. Many years ago, and again, when I was living in Africa, one of the places we lived was very close to a Roman Catholic major seminary. And there were several of the priests there uh, who actually came from French-speaking areas in Africa, I mean in, in Europe, several of the priests there we got to know pretty well. And finally, I got up courage, and I gave him a copy of Desire of Ages. And he loved it. And he, used to, he, he would go around <laughs> using Desire of Ages to teach all. He would go out and hold these seminars for Catholics here and there all over the place using Desire of Ages. Yeah. That all right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's our duty to share, but after that, we can't hit them over the head. We just yeah. share. Well, this says it's better. I, I'm, now I'm looking at Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. Better to correct someone openly than to let him think you don't care for him at all. Friends mean well even when they hurt you. But when an enemy puts, it, puts an arm around your shoulder, watch out. How do we understand those verses? People don't like to be corrected. Well, but if you know they're doing something wrong, is it better to correct them openly? or? And then they don't speak to you? I had the experience today of <laughs> talking to someone who made a mistake, and they really appreciated it and said, you know, come back, we need to, we need to discuss this. I need to understand where that happened. Good. I, Fortunately, I don't have to do that kind of stuff very often. Good for that person. He mm -hmm. was open. Mm -hmm. An mm -hmm. enemy who puts their arm around your shoulder, wasn't that Bertie Madoff? <laughs> Didn't he mm -hmm. actually handle his friend's money? Yeah. And even the money of a hospital orphanage and stuff? So that would be a friend that puts his arm around your shoulder you should be aware of. A few verses later, Proverbs 27, verse 17, it says, People learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. What does that mean? That's what we're doing here. Okay. What does that mean? 
Well, if you share ideas and people are actually listening to what you say, mm -hmm. then there's, an uh, there's a chance to learn something, right? Mm -hmm. We can grow. We can grow collectively. Your ideas get honed. Yeah. You might even learn that some of your ideas aren't quite right. It's one of the reasons why I like to teach these classes. I learn lots. <laughs> why is it that some people are very reluctant to engage in honest discussions? You ever run across that? Mm -hmm. They don't want to. They don't want to sit down and have a serious discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have to think. Yeah, you have to think. I had a friend tell me, "I've decided I want to be superficial." <laughs> 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 I see. And I won't tell you how close that person was to me. And I wanted to ask, "What do you mean?" And. Um, She's proceeded along those lines. Yeah. So it was a conscious decision. I think life was getting too much and decided. <laughs> That's your friend that did that? I won't, yeah, well, a very, very close person. Uh -huh. it, was it her life or um, her friends? <laughs> People don't want their vote wrong. This is her choice. That was Yeah. Her. I just so wondered. What, what's the kindest way to tell a friend that danger is coming or that they have made a mistake? That's what I wanted to tell her then, but I. Mm -mm. What's the kindest way? Yeah. Tell us your secret. The man listen well, to you. And you know where I, I hope you know where I'm going with this. How do we tell our Christian friends who have very different ideas than we do about the imminent soon coming of Jesus Christ? Is it kind not to tell them the truth? Well, that's the I don't question. Think so I think it's kind to tell them the truth. It's just we have to be. Compassionate about it. I, 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 that's my question. How do you be compassionate as you tell people something they don't want to hear? You know, a lot of times, though, when you go over the to straighten them out, you haven't really done any research to find out where they're at, mm -hmm. and so you start spewing out whatever you're you're talking about, and maybe they're not ready to go that direction. You know, you have to study your audience a little bit. Mm -hmm. You can't put them all into one category and say, okay, this sermon here will work for everybody. Yeah. And so you start reading it to everybody and you expect it to work. If everything's going well in their life, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty tough to get them to take another look at the information that they've been raised with or the culture that they're in. If, if, you're, if you, someone comes to you and starts slandering somebody else, how should you respond? Slandering? Like mm -hmm. um, telling gossiping. Un, gossiping about them? If they're not there to defend themselves, I think you either withdraw or you try and point out that this is, you can't agree with that. The truth is, unfortunately, that the people who will gossip to you about somebody else are just as likely to gossip to that other person about you. That's right. right. When we hear someone giving this flowery speech, this nice speech about something, do red flags go up in our minds? Yeah, they should. You know, uh, on today's newscast and that sort of thing, I don't think we hear much flowery speech, do we? Maybe we do. It seems like it's all arguing. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Empty speech is a lot of it. Yeah. Well, and you listen to just the brief news, it seems like all you get to hear about is people killing other people. Yeah. 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 I think what you're saying about flowery, that means it's good news or it's no, nice no. news? No, or flowery means they're Dripping with oil. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe like a politician promising what yeah. he's going to do. Yeah. But I think getting back to your earlier question, if you believe as we do, we need to try and tell people mm -hmm. diplomatically, because we are also told the day's coming when they'll come back and ask us why we didn't warn them. Yep. When I, I went to often. when I went to the Daniel class with the Rapture people. Uh, lately, I said that uh, the rapture certainly would be plan A. I would like to be out of here, but I'm also studying plan B in case it doesn't happen. And so they asked me what plan B was. <laughs> and okay, so, good. you know, I had plan A and plan B, and I put their plan, yes, I would love to 
disappear from here. But yeah. plan B is what happens if we have to go through it, you know? So. Yeah. Well, once again, we, we almost got to this last week, but I, I would like to mention this again. This is found in Mount of Blessing, page 68, paragraph 3. Mm -hmm. Everything that Christians do should be as transparent as the sunlight. Truth is of God, deception in every one of its myriad forms is of Satan. And whoever in any way departs from the straight line of truth is betraying himself into the power of the wicked one. Yet it is not a light or an easy thing to speak the exact truth. We cannot speak the truth unless we know the truth. And how often preconceived opinions, mental bias, imperfect knowledge, errors of judgment prevent a right understanding of matters with which we have to do. We cannot speak the truth unless our minds are continually guided by Him who is truth. Well, how's that for a mouthful? Mm -hmm. How often do we unwittingly deceive in our speech? I've used the example before and I'll use it again. You come to work and you, you, get up and you wake up in the morning and you feel terrible. You feel rotten. But you think, yeah, I've got to go to work even if I feel rotten. So you walk in the door and says, how are you this morning? Oh, I'm fine. Is that true? Not true at all. But they um, don't have time to listen to your woes. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, Is and that, yet we've read the statement from Ellen White also, uh, something about parents and teachers, you have to be bright. Yes. For the children. Yes. Yeah, Is that being honest? Shades yeah, smile for the children. Yes. Shades of ethics over here. Yes. You could say it's okay as long if you're not sneezing to but tuberculosis or something all over. <laughs> so is this being kind of legalistic here? Well, let's think about this. As scary as it may be to do so, we need to be fully aware and to admit that God knows and sees everything. Every detail of our lives will come up in review in the final judgment. When discussing the history of Jacob and comparing that to the time of Jacob's trouble in the future, Ellen White penned, penned these words, the long black catalog of our delinquencies is before the eye of the infinite. The register is complete. None of our offenses are forgotten. How are you happy to know that God hasn't forgotten a single one of your sins? But he who listens to the cries of his servants of old will hear the prayer of faith and pardon our transgressions. He has promised and he will fulfill his word. Patriarchs and Prophets 202.4 Does God grade on the curve? <clears throat> I've asked that question a number of times in the past. You know, God, I was bad, but so-and-so was worse. Yeah. But so-and-so was better. Well, think about that, and that's a good question. The, the point is, would God dare to allow anybody into heaven who's going to start the great controversy all over again? No. I don't know if he's as smart as he's supposed to be. Wouldn't it be the minimum requirement is to be teachable? Mm -hmm. If you're teachable, you, you should have no, uh, willing to take instruction. That's, mm -hmm. that's the minimum requirement. Well, like you said before, there's no prisons or padded cells in heaven, yep. and so we have to all get along, and we cannot have anybody that would end up um, needing, this, yeah. needing to be in a padded isolation. So what is our role in all of this? Are there some things that we have to do and other things for which we must depend upon God? Our brains are the only instrument God has given us for determining what is truth. You can't use your heart or a muscle or a bone to figure out truth. It has to be done in your brain. We must diligently and intelligently use them. And I quote once again, this is Ellen White, Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 361 and 362. The agency of the Spirit of God does not remove from us the necessity of exercising our faculties and talents, but teaches us how to use every power to the glory of God. The human faculties, when under the special direction of the grace of God, 
are capable of being used to the best purpose on earth. Ignorance does not increase humility or spirituality of any professed follower of Christ. Truths of the divine word can be best appreciated by an intellectual Christian. Boy, in some people's minds, that would be almost a contradiction in truth, in, 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 in thinking. Christ can be best glorified by those who serve him intelligently. The great object of education is to enable us to use the power which God has given us in such a manner as to represent the religion of the Bible and promote the glory of God. We are indebted to him who gave us existence for the talents that have been entrusted to us, and it is a duty we owe our Creator to cultivate and improve these talents. Wow. Yeah, what does that tell us? Jesus spoke to the most simple of people. Uh, sometimes I think intelligence gets overrated. Oh. You can think oh, wow. yourself out of God. Well, some people do. But that's not because they're intelligent, that's because they're stupid. I also heard that the whole body was set up to feed the brain. Yes, uh, and carry it around. And carry and it around. It, so it. that is the most important part of us because that's how God communicates. As a neurologist, I strongly agree with that. You strongly agree with Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. It was a new... The heart is just an organ to get nutrients and up we've there. had <laughs> many arguments about this because without the heart, the brain would get nothing. <laughs> but that's why the heart's there. Mm. The heart of a man brain? is where he does his thinking. No, right here. Yeah, the heart of a man is where you do your thinking. That's right. So the heart is in the, really in the brain. <laughs> right. That's all you really are is what's behind this bone. Yeah. This, the, this is the, just... Uh, the entire rest of the body serves only one function, and that's to care for, transport, feed, protect the brain. And living is to be able to think and to do. If you don't you believe live. that, take a person and extract his brain and see what's left. So when we eat, <laughs> exercise, um, avoid alcohol, caffeine and stuff, we are helping our brain and helping communicate with God better. Yep. I don't know how you can separate the brain from the body, though, because you well, don't get yeah. anything. I mean, nothing works without them both together. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the you, point also, but, yeah. but it is all for the brain because without brain we are you know without well, you, body the with, with, brain with, with, will oh, just sit on. there and die there's 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 I mean like that with, like that you can be missing an arm you can be missing both arms you can missing both legs you can lose most of your liver there's a lot you can lose one ear you can transplant the heart you can transplant the liver you can transplant the a lung you can transplant the kidneys well i can lose a lot of hair too and it doesn't do anything to my brain but That's i right. can take my toenails off it doesn't do anything to my brain how much but, how much brain would you like to spare well you know there's a lot of people that are born with a good share of their brain off yeah. Without their brain, and they no, and live okay. Yeah. They just have to learn to sing the song, Jesus loved me, yes I know, for the Bible tells me so. I, I, just, I just don't understand this talk of, of these two pieces being taken apart, the one being more important than yeah. the other. Well, would you agree with another statement? Smart people keep their friends close and their enemies closer? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? means you have to know, you have to have knowledge. You better pay very careful attention to the people that you know aren't too... Well, you friendly. don't want to let them out of your sight. The other ones that are your friends, you can probably trust a little you, bit. You can trust them out of your yeah. sight, but uh, <laughs> you don't want to let someone stab you in the back. Who was it, Voltaire or somebody said? Only someone close I can think. get close enough to stab you in the back. Yes, yes. It wasn't a, it was Voltaire or one of those philosophers said uh, he didn't mind his enemies. He can take care of those. It was his friends that bothered him. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, people cannot always be trusted. Can the Bible be trusted? Yes. Can it be misapplied? Yes. How many times has Satan misquoted the scriptures, even to Jesus? Many. Anywhere he could. In our difficult times, does God seem further from you or closer? How should we respond when God seems distant? Why do you think Paul and Silas were singing while chained in that Philippian prison? 
Probably they couldn't sleep. Might as well sing, right? When we are confused and feeling lost, Ellen White has suggested that we need to look back to the last place where we saw the light. And I quote, When temptations assail you, when care, perplexity, and darkness seem to surround your soul, look to the place where you last saw the light. Minister of Healing 250, paragraph 1. That's interesting. How, how would that work? How, what does it mean to look to the last place where you saw the light? The last place you felt close to God, that you felt like you were really communicating, okay. and maybe review that in your mind, the situation okay. and where you were, what does it mean to you? Yeah. No, I, I agree. Think of the experiences. I've been spending quite a lot of time talking about, uh, studying about Jacob and Joseph and teaching classes about them. And by the way, if some of you are interested in some of that material. It's available on our website at theox.org. It's on the screen there. Occasionally you'll see it, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So I've, been, I've got some material going up there soon on Jacob and Joseph. Um, they had tremendous ups and downs in their experience. And yet they mean, they remain, I mean, imagine Joseph after being a petted son, all of a sudden he's, you know, beaten, his coat of many colors is, is taken. Uh, he's sold as a slave to go down into Egypt. What, what was going through his mind in that time? Well, maybe that they took everything from me. They're not going to take my God. Yeah. Well, Ellen White has some very interesting comments about his way, his trip down there. She says, he grew up in a few days what would have otherwise taken him years. He is basically, like you said, he says, they've taken everything else away from me, but I'm not going to allow them to take my experience with my father or with my God. And he got down to Egypt, and he didn't care what those people said down there. He, he lived among all that pomp and, and you know, expensive living and all that kind of stuff. and He remained faithful to his God. And Daniel did the same thing because mm -hmm. he was young when he was taken. Is there what no hope for us older ones. In? <laughs> what things does God? We, we talked about looking behind the mask. Mask. What do, things does God conceal that we're thankful He conceals? Some of our future. Some of what our else? past. What about some of our past? You remember these famous words. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest, I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. But we just read a little while ago, he never forgets anything. So what are we talking about here? God is saying, I don't care about those things anymore. I'm not going to talk about them. I won't I can, hold them against you. I don't, I'm not going to hold them against you. We're not going to talk about those things. I'm going to conceal many of the sins that you've committed in the past. Maybe not everything. There might be some times when we have to reveal some things, but I'm very thankful that God is willing to conceal some things. What is the core question of the great controversy? Who is God? Is Character. God telling us the truth? Is God Who is telling us the truth? Is it God or, this, or the devil? Do we really believe God's truths? And if so, why? Or are we deceived by the devil's lies? How many Christians are teaching the devil's lies and claiming that they are gospel truth? Do I dare answer that? Yeah. One third Lots. of the angels believed the devil's lies. That's pretty scary because think, if you were an angel in heaven when the, it was going on, the battle in heaven, 
would you have been in the two-thirds of the angels or would you have fallen for Satan's ways and been in the one-third? It's scary wow. to think that you know you could have been in the one-third. And the scary part is that God, uh, Satan has had a lot of a practice deceiving angels and beings from that day until this. And so who are we yeah. to be able to stand under his um, deceptions? One of the other things to consider is that the one-third followed Satan the two-thirds were not committed to Satan, but they may have believed a lot of it. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until at least uh, Abraham and Isaac's sacrifice and then the cross that they were convinced. Mm -hmm. Or and they totally understood what was going scary. on. That's scary, yeah. Ellen White wrote these words, Oh, the mystery of godliness. Does that mean God's concealing something? God manifested in the flesh. This mystery increases as we try to comprehend it. It is incomprehensible, and yet human beings will allow worldly, earthly things to intercept the faint view it is possible for mortals to have of Jesus and his matchless love. How can we be enthusiastic over earthly common things and not be stirred with this picture, the cross of Calvary, the love that is revealed in the death of God's dear Son? I shall if saved in the kingdom of God, be constantly discerning new depths in the plan of salvation. What does that tell us? Right, constantly expanding our understanding of yeah. God. And we'll, like you said earlier, we'll be doing it for eternity. Yeah. Continually learning. <clears throat> Could we be learning more things about this earth's history and the history of sin that we don't know now? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're living in a sea of deception that everything about it, or around us is, is, operates yeah. on deception. New depths in the plan of salvation. That's going to be very interesting. All the redeemed saints will see and appreciate as never before the love of the Father and the Son. And songs of praise will burst forth from immortal tongues. Do you think it would be possible to go up to God the Father and give Him a hug? Yep. Not, not sure. Got to get yep. there to find out. <laughs> get there to find we're out. We're talking about the infinite one, and the infinite one communicates to his finite creatures through finite beings. And Jesus was a f that method, of, a means of communication. And if we don't get to hug the Father, are we going to be disappointed? He says, "You've seen me. You've seen the Father." Yeah. So I, I don't know that we need to go too far down. But yet, we read in ex places like Exodus twenty-four. He's like a fiery flame. Yeah, and the the righteous live in that fire. Isaiah yeah. 33, 4, or yeah. 33, 14. We, we should actually look at that Isaiah. On, before you, yeah. I love this verse. Songs of praise will burst forth from immortal tongues. Mm -hmm. I always have wanted to sing, mm -hmm. and I just croak like a frog. And so when I hear these beautiful singers, mm -hmm. I always think, okay, is this the voice I want? Do I want this voice, this voice? <laughs> Very and good. I'm thinking, what, you know, because I want to sing. You remind me of a funny story about the guy who broke his arm and the doctor was fixing and setting his arm and he said, Doc, when, when my arm heals, will I be able to play the piano? And the doc said, sure, no problem. Oh, he says, I've always wanted to play the piano. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what was it in Isaiah you were going to look at? Oh, yeah, yeah, Isaiah 32. Well, let me re finish this paragraph real quickly. With glorified bodies, I'm sorry, he loved us, he gave his life for us, with glorified bodies, with enlarged capacities, with hearts made pure, with lips undefiled, we shall sing the riches of the redeeming love. Maranatha, page 318, paragraphs 3 and 4. So we're all going to sing. We're going to sing. Um, my working hypothesis is that I will go up and put my arms around the Father. Okay. Or would you be disappointed if you... I, if, if I get there and I, I don't, then, you know, that's okay. But, uh, so, if you put your arms around Jesus, you, that wouldn't be the same? That may be the same. May be the same, okay. We can even hug point. the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because you're hugging Jesus? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give three hugs. <laughs> all, it took all three to save me. <laughs> so you're going to hug Jesus three times? What if you have to do that? 
No, I'm going to find the Holy Spirit and the Father. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Whatever you can see. Look at was <laughs> Isaiah 31. 33, isn't it? 33, I think. Yeah, you're right. 33, 14. I believe it starts with 10, I believe. Let's look at that. We're about running out of time. The Lord says to the nations, Now I will act. I will show how powerful I am. You make worthless plans, and everything you do is useless. My spirit is like a fire that will destroy you. You will crumble like rocks burnt to make lime, like thorns burnt to ashes. Let everyone near and far hear what I have done and acknowledge my power. And how would you feel after hearing that speech? The sinful people of Zion are trembling with fright. They say, God's judgment is like a fire that burns forever. Can any of us survive a fire like that? You can survive if you say and do what is right. So who's surviving in the fire? Those who do what is right. Those who say and do what is right. Don't use your power to cheat the poor and don't accept bribes. Don't join with those who plan to commit murder to do other evil things. Then you will be safe. Where? In the fire. You will be as secure as if you were in a strong fortress. You will have food to eat and water to drink. That's why Ellen White said, and we, knew, we know this is true, that the same fire that destroys the wicked will give life to the righteous. So, and I, in my final couple minutes, minute left here, no calamity can befall the least of his children, no anxiety harass the soul, no joy cheer, no sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Psalm 147, verse 3. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Steps to Christ, page 100. Imagine being the sole attention of God. What would it be like? Think of yourself as being the one person that God cares about. Can you imagine that? How does it make you feel? That's what he says. Each one of us is import so important to him that it's like we, he would focus his entire intention just on us. See you next week. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, to learn about you. We thank you for these complicated passages and proverbs and they give us an opportunity to scratch our brains. Now be with those who are listening to our presentation that it may be a benefit to them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.